Welcome to Premium Cashflow Real Estate Investing Podcast with Sakar Kauli. During this program, you will hear guest experts sharing their experiences, best practices, and market insights. We discuss investing in multifamily apartment complexes and how a busy professional can passively invest hassle-free in various opportunities. Your host, Sakar Kauli, owns millions of dollars of assets and has done thousands of value-add projects over 20 years now. So listen in for insights. Here's your host, Sakar Kauli. Welcome to another edition of Premium Cashflow Podcast. Today, I have one of my favorite guests, Omar Khan. Welcome to the show, Omar. Uh, Thank you, Sakar. Pleasure to be here and an honor to be here. (laughs) Thank you for taking time today. A little bit about Omar. Omar is the founder and president with Boardwalk Wealth. And within their company, they have done over 1,100 units and uh, with few deals that they have under contract, they're still counting on. So with that said, Omar, uh, please give us uh, just a few background uh, of uh, uh, how you came about uh, with such uh, enriched success and uh, what you see for in front of you. <laughs> oh man, you've really hyped me up now. I hope I'm able to live up to your uh, good, good words. Sure. Uh, look, uh, my family uh, has um, over the years invested a lot in commercial real estate. They were an entrepreneurial family. So this is not what they did. This is just kind of where they parked their money. And I had just seen the benefits of it over a, over a very long period of time, not just three, five years, but say a 20, 30, 40 year period of time. Sure. Then I was on the investment banking M&A side. Um, I did a lot of that for about close to 10 years. I'm a CFA charter holder. So on the specific institutional investment management side, I was there for a very long period of time. So I had a lot of those um, aspects and technicalities already built as part of my professional background. Mm-hmm. So when I moved to the U.S. from Canada three years ago, uh, it was relatively in, in one way, it was relatively easy for move, to me to move in because, quote unquote, the technical part I had down because I was doing way more complex deals on the institutional side. Mm-hmm. But we did partner up with a lot of folks to give us relationships in the market because as I was moving in here, you know, real estate is a lot of it's a relationship based game, right? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So building those relationships obviously took time. But, you know, I had a different entry than a lot of other people do. And I only realized that in hindsight after I started doing this. Sure, a lot sure. of people move from residential to commercial. Whereas I just never was interested in residential to begin sure. with. You were already in the fast train. You just didn't know. It. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to go to the faster train then. Let's put it this way. No, I mean, uh, it, see, it's, it's, it's one thing nice that you have that professional background and you yeah. apply those principles to the, you know, the commercial apartment world, which is exactly, I think, what you need. Whereas, uh, you know, someone like me, for example, who came from, uh, you know, like the residential side doing, uh, you know, house renovations mm-hmm. and things like that, it takes a certain amount of uh, you know knowledge curve you build upon and you get into the commercial side both can be done but nothing like uh, someone like you who has a background yeah but you also have to realize that didn't happen overnight i spent the first sure, 10 years sure. of my life most of my 20s early 30s basically working 80 to 100 hours a week sure. right mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. trust me i also learned the hard way <laughs> <laughs> Good. So Omar, today, um, I think my plan is that let's cover, uh, you know, like sort of the practical nuts and bolts of investing. Uh, Just to give our listeners a background, how about we start from going into sub markets, then, you know, going into like, okay, how we analyze those things. Once you you have zoned in on a sub market, how we go about, you know, walking the deals. And once the deal uh, is, you think it's promising, how we go about, you know, underwriting what aspects we look for. So, and, and, you know, we can go into asset management and things like that. So let's start with, you know, what factors uh, for a sub market uh, I would, I'm referring. So let's start with, you know, how do you go about selecting the sub market? Like what are the kind of signs you look for a promising sub market? Look, so the typical answer on a podcast is you look for rent growth, income growth, population growth, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Sure. Mm-hmm. I'm going to tell you that's a great answer, but it's a wrong answer because what happens is, look, if you live in say Houston, and assuming you don't have an unlimited travel budget and all the time in your world, there's no use for you to look in Colorado, even though that might be the best, or Denver, that might be the best market in the world. Sure. Traditionally, uh, look, you can do it the easy way or you can do it the painful way. The painful way is you're trying to optimize and try to find the best market in the country. But the problem is you probably won't be the only person who's found that market. 
because the other 320 million Americans also know about that place. Sure. So typically what I suggest people to do is look, don't try to find the best market in the world. Mm -hmm. Try to find the market that is the best fit for you. So for instance, right. in this example, if you live in Houston and let's assume you do a W2 job, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got a family and all that jazz, right? Sure. Maybe mm -hmm. even a best market in Austin or Dallas might not be best for you. Sure. It might be a good market, might not be best for you. So what you got to figure out is, given your time and resources, mm -hmm. what is first of all possible for you? Mm -hmm. And in the context of what is possible for you, then you have to figure out what are what is the best value value for your buck. So then you start looking at job, income, all of that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Because it's no use for you to find the best market in the world, and then you can't do anything about it. I 100% agree with you. So uh, I know earlier you shared, um, uh, Omar, that you have a unique way of how you go about, uh, oh, yeah. you know, sort of analyzing these things. Do you want to maybe run into that and kind of show sure. us? How, how so you I'm going to share my video with you. I'm going to share my screen with you so you can sure. have a look. So just for our listeners, um, I want to point out that if you're looking uh, or you, if you're rather listening to the podcast on your, uh, you know, while you're driving or something, I want to point out to you that you want to see the video version uh, of this podcast where Omar is showing us right now uh, screens uh, on a map of Jacksonville uh, market. And he's going to run into how we go deep dive into analyzing these sub-markets and visually seeing, you know, the telltale signs around it. So with that, Omar, go ahead. Sure. So first of all, why did we pick Jacksonville? I live in Dallas, but my partners live in Miami, right? Mm -hmm. So Dallas is a great market, but what we were realizing was that things in Dallas, it's a great market, but the pricing was out of back. And sure. obviously Miami, you know, is just very expensive. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but because we do this full time, we had the budget time and resources after we'd done a few deals in San Antonio and Austin basically pick our next market. But again, that was within drivable distance. So again, it would be no use if I found the best market, let's assume that happened to be Washington DC because neither me nor my partners could go to this. Sure. Right? Mm -hmm. So we started looking at Jacksonville, Tampa and Orlando. And specifically what we were seeing was across the board for similar demographics. So they all have very good job growth. They have very good income growth and population growth. As we all know, a lot of people are moving to Florida. Sure. Mm -hmm. But what we were seeing specifically was that for similar demographics, similar all these other factors, Tampa was just the highest priced. So for everything the same, Tampa pricing just was not making sense for our business model. So it really became a toss up between Jacksonville and Orlando, both very high growth markets with all the factors that fit in. And with Orlando, what we were seeing was Orlando was very patchy. Sometimes yield would come up, sometimes yield wouldn't come up, but Jacksonville, by the time we'd moved in, was still somewhat under the radar. So mm -hmm. what we were able to get is for the same type of tenant, we were able to get a better quality product, I right? Mm -hmm. So once we had figured out on Jacksonville, then you know you do the typical reach out to brokers follow up because that's not what a lot of gurus tell you. They tell you underwriting, blah 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 blah. Right, right. But no so, amount of uh, if I may, Omar, um, the Orlando Miami story that you uh, in Tampa that you were saying now, right? So yes. this is your initial analysis when brokers are sending you some deals and you. No, running. no, this is our analysis from actually visiting. I should have mentioned that this is from actually physically visiting the markets. Interesting. Okay, got it meeting property managers, doing property tours, because guys, a lot of this business you can't do behind your desk. Sure, sure. It's the nature mm -hmm. of the business is you have to go out and meet people. I see. Right? I see. Mm -hmm. So that's the big one because it's a relationship dependent business, right? Absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. you just can't get around it. Absolutely. So I, I so, should have said that. Good right. for clarifying, yeah. Right, good. So with that, then I think you kind of went into Jacksonville market and then you're seeing that based on your uh, sort of personally uh, walking the streets, seeing apartments yeah. and uh, different things, you are seeing that sort of uh, value consistency, that best bank for your yeah. product. Basically. Or basically say, let's assume for say a $40,000 median income. Sure. The mm -hmm. rents that I was seeing were simil somewhat similar across Jackson, Orlando, Tampa. Mm -hmm. But the pricing that I was seeing was about 15 to 20% below Tampa and Orlando. I see. It's so the same basically, type of person, getting less the price. per unit uh, pricing yeah. was much better. So yeah. in effect, your cash flow numbers were working out much better. Oh, uh, the entire deal works out much better, right? Absolutely. absolutely. Across the board. Sure. Right. Sure. So, so then, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying that. So in your map, then uh, you want to go into like how you go about analyzing. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm going to show you everything, man. You can take all my secrets. <laughs> <laughs> so basically... After having, uh, doing a lot of research, what we did is I'm a very visual learner, sure. right? Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to show you now, not as a visual learning, but it's going to help you establish your credibility pretty fast. Sure. So first of all, mm -hmm. what we started doing is we started dividing up the market 
by different types of household income, median household income, right? Because it's very mm-hmm. important in our business to quickly know these things. Sure. So what we did is household income, 90K plus, right? Mm-hmm. You see how this is suddenly filtered out? Mm-hmm. Household income, 60 to 90K plus. Sure. Household median income, 40 to 60K plus. Interesting. Household income, 40K below, right? Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Right? So now what you're seeing, number one over here is, Right off the top, we've got, look, this isn't an easy process. It's quite laborious, actually. Oh, yeah, now, I can imagine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. But when you build this out immediately, what you're going to do is now you're starting to see where are pockets of affluence happening, right? Where are people with more money trending towards? Mm-hmm. And as you can see over here, there's a lot of black over here in Jackson, which basically means less than 40K, but mm-hmm. there's less black over here, right? right? So what you can start seeing is basically, look, this is a better part of town. Now, we knew that, but the data also supports it. I see. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Number one. Number two, what we should start doing is basically what we started putting is basically sales comps. Because when I'm talking to a broker, within 10 seconds of the broker giving me an address, I kind of need to know the income demographics, which I've shown you. Mm-hmm. And I think what I also need to know is if he gives me an address, how much have the properties around it sold for? Right? This, this is, is very bad. valuable information. Right. Because what you don't want to do is when you have this information, there is no back and forth between the brokers. It's not like broker says one thing. So like, okay, it's concrete okay. data. Absolutely. Right. Right over there. Then the other thing what I wanted to see was because we're opportunistically buying. Okay. Where are the best elementary schools? Right. Because that's very important. Absolutely. If you have type tenants, say two or three bedrooms, they're looking for elementary schools. Absolutely. And elementary schools are very neighbor specific, right? Middle schools and high schools are bigger. Absolutely. Absolutely. Young families with young kids, uh, predominantly elementary schools or perhaps middle schools are looking for that best school district, you know? So now what we did, now this is kind of arbitrary because we put good areas are blue. Again, we have to be more specific and red is bad areas, right? Sure. Now we start putting these things. As we drive, we start putting these things on a map. So as you can now start seeing, we've got a pretty good idea about where the city is happening, right? Sure. So let's assume, I'm just going to type an apartment building here that we toured a little while ago, Courtyards at San Jose, right? And this is a random building, right? Now let's assume a broker gives you a call and says, hey, I got this building, Courtyards at San Jose at 6701 St. Augustine Road, Jacksonville, mm-hmm. Florida. Mm-hmm. Now, while you are talking to the broker, as soon as he or she gives you this address, you plump this in right over here. You got your map going, right? Mm-hmm. Now, what do you see? First of all, what you see, let me zoom in over here. Right. You see, whereas technically this is in a me- in median income area that's around $40,000, but it's surrounded by prob- areas that are way higher income. Right, right. So right? just for our listeners, if you're listening here, uh, Omar is highlighting a apartment complex. In, and what pops up is all the uh, different squares uh, within your map indicating you know what the income uh, strata for that uh, particular uh, area is so go ahead omar right so now like you're saying it took you less than 15 seconds to find out you kind of know okay it's surrounded by yeah. higher income mm-hmm. areas so there's potentially a lot of uh, you know potential here right, right. because right. look all what we always want is for a b class asset to be in a c area right or rather a c class asset to be c in a class b class asset in a b area, area. Right. right so now you immediately know if it's surrounded by people with higher higher income, mm-hmm. there's some juice here, right? Now let's assume the broker gives you, oh, this property is selling for, I'm making up a number, $75,000 a unit, right. right? You immediately know, as you can see on this map, you have a comp here, right? Mm-hmm. You click on this comp, you know, 22.7 million divided by 384, right? This is how much it costs. So, so 22, 700,000 divided by three, how much is it? 384, 384 right? Let me just yeah. put it here, right. 384. Now you know that it's sold for, $59,000. Right, right. Right. So now the broker says this is selling for $75,000, right? You pretty you much. Know, that's interesting. Why did, you know, what's the deal here? Because the Heron Walk sold at 7400 Powers Avenue sold for $55,000, right? right? And all of this happens in less than 20 seconds, as you've seen here, right? right. This is Come very on. powerful, Omar. Uh, right. Right. Couple of questions there, Omar. Yeah. The income strata that uh, was mapped, is that a in-house work or you... No, have... that's from the U.S. Census median income. Right, right. right. But is that those layers that you uh, shown earlier, right? For below 90K or above 90K, yeah. above 60K, that income range uh, uh, demographics that you showed there. Um, was that something... Uh, in-house done or is that readily available for any... No, no, you got to do this yourself, man. Because okay. you have to realize, 
you can pay for a subscription to some mm -hmm. really expensive software, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but what I'm showing you is literally stuff that you can do for free. Right, right. It's so on Google Maps. I see. So basically you're saying that, um, I know, I think uh, uh, I'm aware that New York Times also has uh, some of that census charted, uh, something similar uh, that I had observed uh, early on. Uh, so you're saying that anybody can take uh, like a particular zip code data yeah. and plug in and uh, like once they say that, okay, this is a sort of a sub market in, in this case, you, you have Jacksonville uh, that you zoned in. You can say that, okay, I'm going to study this city. And I think uh, based on, uh, you, you know, the prior conversation, you said you found value in Jacksonville. So oh, you yeah. said, hey, we're going to like get a detailed data or uh, perhaps yeah. for zip code on Jacksonville and start mapping those numbers uh, into a map. Is that? Oh, correct? yeah. Oh, yeah. Because look, all of this is a data driven exercise, right? Sure. This isn't a feelings based thing. Hey, I feel like this is a good deal. This mm -hmm. is all like, hey, are, do the numbers back up our theory? Mm -hmm. And if the numbers back up our theory, then we take the next step. Then we do all the property tours and all of that stuff. Then we do the under, you know, it, it's a step-by-step -step process. Sure. Because what's no use is that every time a broker sends you an email or a deal, you just start jumping up and start doing things because you're going to waste your time all the time. Right. So you right. need to have a specific investment criteria. Mm -hmm. You need to see these things. So before, for instance, if you can only buy assets that are 10 to $15 million, right? Mm -hmm. And if somebody sends you a deal for $50 million, Right. right, that's not going to work. You look at it because what are you right. going to do? Right, right, right. And I think this is very important here, Omar. I think what what basically you're describing is you have a framework, a concrete uh, sort of a foundation that you can work off of. You can plug in an address and uh, you know get uh, you know concrete results, uh, whether yeah. it works or not, or you have some intelligence around it, basically. Yeah, but you know, the other big thing what we also realized is, A, obviously, look, it's very helpful, right? Mm -hmm. But the other thing what we also realized is that when you're talking to investment salespeople, brokers, property managers, lenders, and without them even knowing, within 20 seconds, if you kind of get all this information, your credibility just shoots through the roof. Sure. Because mm -hmm. you can say, hey, the property down the street sold for 55. Why are you doing it for 75? Sure. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, that's something that the average person doesn't do or cannot do. Right. Right. As soon as a broker hears you that, trust me, mentally, they put you in a different category of people. So you're not just agree. another person. You are a very sophisticated, intelligent buyer. So they will treat you that way. I agree with you. I totally agree with you. So going back to the uh, data here, uh, Omar, can you maybe give us an overview of, uh, you know, how you like get, got the underlying data and what it takes to build it, like how much time it takes for anybody to build it, basically? So first of all, it can take as long as you like because you can get more and more and more. Value, sure, right? sure. Mm -hmm. So the data around the income is available from the U.S. Census by zip code. So mm -hmm. median income is available by zip code. Mm -hmm. The data around the best elementary schools, you can go to websites like Create Schools or Good Schools. Sure, sure. Website. Mm -hmm. That's where we got it from. Mm -hmm. The data around comps. Now, what happens in a market like uh, Texas, because Texas is a non-disclosure state. Mm -hmm. So what happens is it's hard to get comps. Because right. you know, if you declare it, then you have to pay higher taxes and nobody does that, right? right? But in markets like Florida, Arizona, Georgia, you're very easily, most markets, in fact, most markets outside of Texas, you're able to get the comp data. Now, right. you can either get the comp data by subscribing to services like CoStar, Reese, Real Capital Analytics, all right. that stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. But what you can also do is when you've established a relationship with the brokers, because the brokers are tracking all of these things, right? Sure. They can also provide you these things. Right. You can just request the sole listings, uh, basically, for yeah. the past. And not just for like the past year, for the past two or three years. So you can kind of see where the market is moving over a period. Correct. Mm -hmm. Right. So to give you an idea, let me show you something, right? Where the market is moving point, because that's also very important to kind of understand. I'm going to take best elementary schools off. Sales 27, sales 20. Okay, so we just know sales 2017. You see how there's a lot of sales happening on the east side, right. relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. But as soon as we go to 2018, you see more deals start happening in this pocket mm -hmm. than before, right? Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing, number one, is regardless of which year you're in, and this is only two years worth of data, mm -hmm. if you invest on the east side of Jacksonville, chances are, that you will have always have a bigger buyer pool. So if you mm -hmm. ever want to get out of your deal, you won't be stuck there. But let's assume you bought in this quadrant over here, the Northwest quadrant. Sure. By the way, just let me tell you, it's a very low income area. It's like a war zone, right? But if you ever buy something here, man, you're going to have a hard time getting out of it because in all of 2018, only one deal got sold. Correct. 
-hmm. right? So this kind of helps you see where the people are moving, how the people are moving, and you can track these things over a period of time. Right. You can almost That's pinpoint that West and East are predominantly, you know, where the deals are happening, you know? Yeah. So you can kind of, and again, the point here is guys that a lot of times you need information quickly. Right. You know, because look, for instance, now what will happen is you see it compared it against comps, it's a good zip code. Now the second thing comes, how are you going to basically underwrite it? Right. Again, this is a topic that most gurus don't touch because this is a technical issue, right? right. I, look, I work in, I'm rather, I, this is my bread and butter, but what I tell people is don't even worry about underwriting. First of all, what you got to do is have filters. Does it filter and fit my investment criteria? Number one, and you look on a map. Then you say, I'm going to do a very high level underwriting, which is not even underwriting to be very honest with you. What right. it is, just, you know, thumb rule whether things work or not, you know? Yeah. So for instance, what you will see is, for instance, the what are the rents in this property and what are the rents in the comps? Because as an example, if this property has overpriced rents by a hundred dollars and there's nothing in the comps that support it, well, what right. are you going to do, man? Correct. You can't yeah, even there's, do anything, there's, right? There's, sorry, right. <laughs> right. Or for instance, you see that this property is running at say 40% operating expense ratio right. and the rents are very high. Well, you can't save money on expenses. You can't do any rent upgrade. So right. there's no use wasting your time doing no, you, you, it would be a hard I mean you you pretty much get stuck in these deals at some point like that yeah and the problem is people get stuck in this analysis paralysis because what right. people think is just if I work three hours it's better than working 15 minutes right. and that's not the way the pros do it right the pros are very lazy in the sense that they're focused and lazy right so lazy in the sense that they'll do the least amount of work but they'll get the most amount of benefit Right, absolutely. I mean, there, there's science to it that they, they have tools and resources that they can filter out, you know, and get to a decision really fast without wasting time. And, you know, that's being a pro. <laughs> yeah, but now you see this, these are, this is publicly available stuff. Literally, you can see here, Google, my maps, right? right? So right. you don't have to pay for this service. You get all of this information for free. So if you're very interested, what I tell people is, look, do this because I had a guy out in Atlanta and he's apparently been living in Atlanta for his whole life. And when I made him go through this exercise, it took him about a week. He literally got back to me and said, he's like, wow, this I did not wild. even know Atlanta this way. And I've been living here my whole life. <laughs> what you don't know, you don't know. You know? Right? So <laughs> right. that's a big thing. Now, moving on. Right. Right. You do the initial and this, you know, rent of expenses. You kind of compare that high level, right? Right. Then immediately, if it makes sense, what you should do is schedule a property tour. Forget about everything else, man. Right, right. Because what you need to do is schedule a property tour. There's two reasons why you need to schedule a property tour. One is that you actually want to visit the property to see look, if things match up because everything looks great in the OM, right? But reality is kind of different. Right. The other thing what you want to do is, which a lot of people don't talk about is, that when you have a property tour and you ask intelligent questions, you're getting face-to-face one-on-one time with a broker. Mm-hmm. You can't do that over the phone. The phone is just, not, it's still not the same thing. And it's, no, I mean, especially can't do 100%. It you got to go physically walk the property. And do you insist, Omar, that when you're doing these property tours, do you insist that you meet and speak and connect with the existing property managers? Oh, and- yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of understood. Mm-hmm. Because typically what will happen is when, okay, look, typically what happens in a property tour is, let's assume a broker says, hey, let's meet at this property at 2 p.m. Mm-hmm. So you'll go to 2 p.m., but what you'll really be going is the property manager's office, right? Sure. You, everybody will meet in the clubhouse or the property manager's office, sure. and you'll go from there. And right. typically, the property manager will be with you on a property tour because they have to open the apartments, sure. some of the apartments, right? Obviously, right. the ones right. that are available. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's a good segue for you to ask questions like, hey, what else do you think we should do? If you had more money, what would you do? What's your biggest problem? And you have a lot of times when you ask the right questions, what you'll see from the back of your side of your eye is, that the broker is cringing because he doesn't want the whole information coming out. Right. right? But a lot of times, man, you're able to get so much information from people right. that you'll never be able to get it, no matter how much analysis you do. Right, right. Now, I, I, I think letting people talk and you have a listening ear to it, especially in these property tours, is extremely important because they will tell and share things. I mean, in fact, I, I sometimes go to an extent saying that, hey, go go talk to a few people in the buildings and you you will notice that, oh, something was not, I mean, you know, maybe they left uh, washer dryers unfixed or some drain that was never attended and you kind of start to see a trend. It's like, you know, what the condition of the- You know, a a trick that I kind of figured out, uh, this is again by accident, but now I kind of use it. Let's you might go for a property tour from two to say 3 p.m., right? Mm -hmm. So we do the property tour, blah, 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 and we leave, right? Right. Mm -hmm. But then I have one of my guys show up, say 15 minutes after I've left, 
trying to, you know, secret shop an apartment. Mm -hmm. But by that time, everybody's guard is down because now the property tour is over. Right. 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 And now when he or she goes in, it's very easy for the property tour manager to be like, oh yeah, this is an apartment. And a lot of times they'll show you some of the apartments that they haven't shown me when I was doing the official property tour. Right. Because right. it's a guided tour, right? Sure. So you're sure. able to get a lot more information or the guy or my guy will go in and before he goes to the property manager, if you see somebody hanging outside, he'll just ask him, hey man, what's up? How are you? And just initiate a conversation. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So that gets you a lot of soft things that you're never even going to find out. And by the way, a lot of times, if you develop a good relationship with a broker, they'll tell you things. Right. And, and speaking of all this, Omar, that when you, at what point you start to, you know, maybe spend money, uh, do you do like, do you like start doing, uh, you know, inspections and paid, uh, uh, you know, oh, no, uh, contractors and stuff that do you bring in? Do you do any of that before, uh, you know, you have a deal under contract uh, just to make a, uh, just as an additional due diligence step for you? Or you do all of that work after the deal is under contract? No, first of all, Sakar, you know, I'm a desi guy, so I'm averse to spending money if I don't have to. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. But look, the bigger deal is <laughs> after we've done the property tour and assuming we like it, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to underwrite the deal now in more complexity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excuse me. And once we pass that little stage, let me take, let me stop sharing the screen. So when we pass that little stage, what happens now is mm -hmm. that look, for instance, let's assume we like the deal once we underwrite it, blah, sure. blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. We'll schedule a second property tour. And in mm -hmm. that property tour, in all likelihood, if I haven't done this already, because I tried doing this earlier, but if I haven't, I'll take my property manager with me, mm -hmm. right? The property management company that I like. Mm -hmm. And typically I'll kind of do the whole song and dance sequence again. Because I what see. happens is if you're partnering with good property managers mm -hmm. that are especially very well entrenched in the market, mm -hmm. they kind of have to know about all the assets in the market. It's just a business, right? That's just the way it is. Absolutely. So now they're able to add stuff. They're right. able to see things that you and I are not able to see. Very, very good point. So you're bringing in an external property manager and seeing or analyzing things through their eyes, yeah. which is actually, that's a very good tip. So not just depending on your intuition or what, the other property manager or the broker would have told you, which is yeah, because look, look, I have a specialty, right? I'm in, I, we're in acquisitions, we buy stuff, but I don't want to do everybody's job. No, I know. I, I can't and I don't want to. Right, right, right. Right. right? So okay. they have a specific job and the bigger deal is if you're with good property managers, especially that are well entrenched in the market, mm -hmm. like I said earlier, dude, it's a big word, but it's a very small word. Right. So people talk with each other in a profession. Sure. So a lot of times they're able to tell you, yeah, you know, the owner, he's in big financial trouble. He wants to sell right. or one owner doesn't even care as long as he gets the highest price. So those are very good information to have. Right, right. And one of the things I always say is also is that these property managers are wealth of knowledge. Oh, they will yeah. have, uh, you know, they, as you said, it's a small world. They would know all the contractors or different uh, actors who are active in that area. And people talk, word spreads out. They will know more about sometimes the other property that, hey, the property, you know, a few miles from here had deferred maintenance that was not corrected. And now it's under contract. So you better check what's going on. So that, that is oh, yeah. a valuable piece of information. So speaking of this now, uh, you know, Omar, moving on into underwriting. Mm -hmm. So what are the key elements you look for? Like, I guess what I'm getting at is that when you're looking at a PL, for example, are you like, are there any telltale signs that, oh, they have like high contract services? Oh, there's, you know, like uh, excess payroll. So mm -hmm. do you have any rules of thumb that, okay, if, if let's say, for example, let's say it's a 200 unit uh, uh, complex we're dealing with, right? So do, do you have a sort of a rule of thumb? You say that, oh, okay, for 200 unit, maybe you need like five or six person staff, you know, two could be leasing agents, four could be. So tell us like, you know, sort of walk us through like some initial uh, things that you, you know, try to look for when you're seeing a P&L for these size properties. Well, first of all, the caveat is uh, cost structures differ by market. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and they also obviously also differ by the size of the building you're buying, but there's still a base level of fixed cost, regardless of what you're, you could be buying a two right. unit if you want to put a manager or 150 units. Right. right. 
That being said, typically contract service is a hard one to figure out because that is dependent on your submarket and that's right. dependent on your business plan and what your tenants like and all that. Right. But typically the big ones are payroll, taxes, those are the big ones usually, and utilities, right? right. So typically on payroll, at least in Dallas and say Jacksonville, these are big markets, right? What we're seeing typically is even two or three years ago, people could underwrite at $1,100 per unit and get away with it. Mm -hmm. You're not getting that man anymore. It doesn't matter what your property manager tells you. In reality, if you have a big enough property, I'm talking 300 plus units, you might get away with 1250 mm -hmm. per unit. But really, if you're anywhere between 100, 275, 200 units, you're anywhere between 1275 to $1,400 and more in the 1350 range per unit. Everything mm -hmm. I'm gonna tell you is per unit, right? Yeah. Similarly, with taxes, what you've got to figure out is, because that's your biggest expense, right? Mm -hmm. So what you've got to figure out is, A, which side of the year are you in? So as an example, excuse me, if you purchase a property in March, now the taxes for the year are already decided. Right. So let's say the property was $10 million when the owner bought it, and now you buy it at $20 million. So quote unquote, your taxes will double, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. But for those nine months, at least your taxes will not double. They'll right. double from the next time the taxes reset. Right. Right. So you can, so if you underwrote it at a higher tax rate, then you're you're not even going to be competitive against sophisticated people, right? Because so you got to watch out for that. Where in the year are you at? Because right. that will determine at least for the remainder of the months how much taxes you're going to pay. Are you going to pay it at the old basis? Or are you going to pay it at the new basis? Right? Sure. Then, for instance, in Florida, at least what happens is if you pay by forgetting, I think if you pay by November first or something, but don't quote me on it, you can get a four percent early payment discount. You do, but, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, but that's not the case in Texas, right? So for instance, if you budget properly, you can save a lot of money there as well, 10, 20, 30 grand as well, right? Oh okay. yeah, I mean, that's big money right there. I mean, my point is you're gonna have to pay it anyway, so you might as well save money. Sure. Right, sure. if you account for it properly, right? Right. So right. you can do that. And then with utilities, what happens is, previously, even till like about a year ago, or a year and a half ago, what people were doing was, they were getting these green financing. I don't know if you've heard about it, right? I, I absolutely, and, I'm aware of you it. Know, yes. And what was happening was all you kind of had to do was put like low flow toilets and fix the plumbing and you were good to go. That doesn't work anymore. Because with the new rules that are coming in place in the last six, eight months, you can't just go and put in low flow toilets and you kind of fix your leaky faucets and you're you done. You do a whole lot more. <laughs> yeah, you got to fix your, like, because you have to hit certain metrics across the board. Correct. correct. So I even think though it's total, going you to, might be saving, you've got to hit those certain metrics, right? Lighting, LEDs, motion sensors. There's there's a whole array of things that, uh, I mean, last time when I looked at it, I was like, oh my God. I mean, there's, I think that there's different levels of it based and you get credits for based on how much you're doing is uh, what I gathered. I was like, I said, oh yeah. So it's becoming way harder because earlier people would be like green financing and you're done. Right. Right. Things don't really work like that anymore. Right. So, uh, Omar, speaking of the value add strategies, like uh, when you're analyzing these deals, how much, uh, you know, like a rent differential uh, you look for to, uh, you know, uh, like size up these deals and also what are like maybe, you know, top five things you look at like interior wise, exterior wise to see like, okay, how quickly you can, you know, do the rehabs, what could be your, you know, short term goals, you know, and maybe two year out how you're doing the value add. Can you maybe share some words about that? Sure, I'd love to. So typically, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, just see, let me start with the interiors and exteriors, right? Sure. Typically the, because then that can translate into rents, right? Typically right. what you're seeing with interiors, we prefer obviously slightly more value add than less value add, which just gets us more room. Typically what we're seeing is two-tone paint, resurfaced countertops, black appliances instead of white. You know, uh, you replace some of the medicine cabinets or paint them again, put low flow toilets in, add lighting package. Lighting is like, I think the highest ROI on the planet, I think for anything, <laughs> right? Uh, and basically the deal there is about vinyl flooring, you know, the dark vinyl flooring that's coming in. Right, right, the plank in floor. Channels. Right, yeah. right. So th that gets us the highest bang for our buck. That's what we've seen across the board in Dallas, San Antonio, Austin, Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. On the exterior, what we see is a lot of times it's coming in and repositioning the property. So rebranding, putting a new monument and signage, painting everything, that sort of stuff. And you know, you gotta you got have to get away from boring paint colors and kind of have to go with something that pops, right? Mm -hmm. Because as soon as people are walking in, they gotta feel like it's a cool, big deal, sure, right? Sure, sure. And then resealing the driveway, that's a big one. It's only about twenty to $30,000. But what it does is it suddenly makes everything look way nicer. Right. Right. And you're resealing and repainting the driveway. Right. So you consider basically someone driving into your property, how your signage, 
yeah. landscaping is looking like your nice black tar, you know, uh, resurfaced your driveway. Mm -hmm. uh, do you do? Do you place any emphasis on, let's say, a leasing office? That oh you know, yeah, 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 that's a big one, my friend. Because mm -hmm. look, the deal is you got to realize everybody focuses so much on interiors, right? Everybody talks interior, interior, interior. But if somebody walks in and your leasing office doesn't capture their attention. Mm -hmm. they're they're not going to be as inclined. Their mind isn't as primed to actually get this. Sure. It's the first what, impression, right? <laughs> right. And what we've seen is if you're leasing office and clubhouse is just awesome. Spectacular, right? Mm -hmm. Spectacular, right? Honestly, you can get away with spending less money on the interiors because by the time they get to the apartment, mm -hmm. they're already kind of sold. Right. The wow factor, right? Yeah. And do you, do you how, like, uh, since, you know, you, you've done uh, many of these complexes and probably done, uh, uh, you know, rep repositioning of your property managements and things like that, L about your leasing staff, how yeah. do you place emphasis on the culture? Like, hey, uh, like, you know, it goes from, you know, answering the phones or someone walking in the door, placing their emphasis on how you greet your, uh, you know, prospect coming into your door. Yeah. Can you maybe share like some strategies around like how, what are the must that you emphasize, uh, put emphasis on? Uh, sure. So there's a that. Monday morning report we have, which basically we talk about all the way the leads are coming in, how quickly the leads, for instance, are answered, all of the questions around it, leasing, occupancy, vacancy. Then mm -hmm. what we also do is have uh, individual people from time to time secret shop, just to kind of sure. keep everybody honest, right? Right. And right. then the biggest deal is having weekly meetings with your employees mm -hmm. and people who are working for you. Because a lot of times what I see is guys get into trouble where they buy it and they kind of forget about asset management. Because again, asset management is not a sexy topic. Oh, no, right. it is a crucial one, Len, you know, determines your success, how well you are executing your plan. Basically. Yeah, and the problem with a lot of these gurus and mentors is nobody talks about that because A, they don't have any background and B, look, it's hard to explain to people, look, this is a lot of work. Money doesn't fall from the sky, right? right. <laughs> so uh, asset management, typically you need to have at least a weekly minimum call and you need to have an agenda. Otherwise, people will just keep talking about random stuff, right? right and you need right. to keep people on the agenda. But the right. bigger deal that you're doing there is, look, you've got to realize nobody cares about your money like you care about your money. Oh, absolutely. And your yeah. 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 So yeah. if you don't do this, then you're basically not doing your job. So you've got to keep people honest. You've got to have a background. You've got to make sure your books are running the right way. And you've got to keep, and because every week you have to tell people, because what can't happen is two months from now, you're talking about a thing that happened two months ago. No, I know. It's it's almost like I call it like a sort of a two year marathon that you have a sort of a broad schedule of, you know, when leases are coming up, what renovations you might be doing and, you know, what are sort of what long term. So you almost need to have those checkpoints that, hey, these three units got, you know, let's say turned over. So, you know, how we're doing on, uh, you know, the renovation or painting or whatever you might be doing. And then, you know, hey, you know, how are the leads coming in? So you have to, I think, have all those checkpoints and you're kind yeah. of tracking that progress weekly, I guess, right? Oh yeah, 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 minimum. Because this way your property manager will also know that you are a smart operator. So they're not gonna do, they're not gonna get lazy essentially. Right, right, good, good. And uh, man, trying to think, I just blacked out here. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, speaking of all this, then Omar, like, what do you think about exit strategies? Like, how do you, you know, like sort of go about it? Like there, there are certain uh, show tell signs that I have heard other, uh, you know, guests at the podcast say that, oh, don't do the, you know, the, all the value add, maybe leave some of it yeah. for the other operator to come through. So can you maybe describe some of words around it that, hey, you know, how you go about it, what your sort of theory around sure. this? So look, first of all, a lot of times when people say, oh, go do this or that, I personally think that's a lazy answer because it depends A, on your business plan mm -hmm. and B, what it also depends is on what market you're in. So let's assume you're in New York City. I'm just making up an example, sure. right? Mm -hmm. Dude, you can, do all, you can do all of the value add and you'll still find somebody to sell it to, right? <laughs> right. Because yeah. It's the way the market is. Mm -hmm. But say in a smaller market, like say somewhere in, I don't know, Jackson, Mississippi, Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got to leave a lot of meat on the bone for the next guy right. because your buyer pool is very small, number right. one. But what I typically tend to feel, just the way I think about things, is you always need to have multiple plans. Right. So that just is not on the asset management side. That is on the financing side. That is on the investor side. You always have to keep setting expectations. So sure. typically what we try to do is 70 to 80, maybe all the way up to 90% say interior renovations, mm -hmm. but leave some exteriors or do a lot of exteriors, leave some interiors. Mm -hmm. But there is one case where we did everything. Right, because the market is strong, it's in Dallas. Mm -hmm. We know we're gonna have buyers for this, and it was an early 90s, late 90s vintage. 
So yeah. there's going to be buyers for it. It's a new property. People expect us to do it. We get the maximum bang for a buck. So I think that's dependent on your business plan mm -hmm. and that's dependent on what market you're in. Interesting. So one last uh, question, Omar, and I appreciate all your advice uh, today, actually. And speaking of markets and economy as to where we are, as we are recording the show today, we are just about wrapping up, uh, you know, March 2019 uh, here. Yeah. What are your thoughts in terms of, uh, you know, where we are, the whole multifamily market is headed? We are in the sort of still the historic low interest rates and things like that. Do you do you feel that the market is overheated and we are maybe perhaps uh, going to fall off uh, and you know go into a slight contra uh, contraction? Well, first of all, if I knew the answer to that, man, I'd be a really rich guy. <laughs> <laughs> so the law, that's a short answer. The long answer is, look, guys, you have to be disciplined when you're buying, regardless if it's in a recession or an up market. And look, if things don't work out, things don't work out, right? Why buy something on a hope and a prayer? Make sure that you do your research. Things are happening. Look, I know a lot of operators right now that are still buying and that are very disciplined operators right. because they have a strict buy box. And if things don't fit in that little buy box, they don't even do it. Interesting. Right? So you got to be disciplined. That's it. And if it makes you do more deals before you get one deal, that's the way it is. And if you have to do less deals to get one deal, that's just the way it is. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Omar. Uh, thank you for all your advice today. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you and very much for having please me. Tell us how viewers can get hold of you. Yes, sir. So you can go to our website, boardwalkwealth.com. That's B-O-A-R-D, walkwealth.com. You can sign up. It's literally on the homepage. You don't even have to look for it. Sign up, put your email, put your name, and put how you find out about us. And we will basically give you actionable content that you can do day one. This is not like the usual fluffy stuff about thinking positively and then, I don't know, relaxing with a beer or something. It's about how can you do actual stuff to help you make money, okay? Not right. stupid stuff here and there that's not really going to do anything for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what I love about you, Omar. It's all actionable uh, content. You do and you get the results. And that's what we are all about. Not, you know, not a lot of, uh, you know, the soft Fluffy stuff. stuff. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. I appreciate all your words, Omar. And uh, it's been great. And I hope to, uh, you know, have you back again on some another juicy topic. So it's <laughs> a <real> pleasure. <laughs> no, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much. Thank for you. Me. And I look forward to it. Okay. Have a good one. Have Bye. A good one. Thanks. All right. Thanks for listening to Premium Cashflow Real Estate Investing Podcast. Please join us at premiumcashflow.com to sign up for weekly updates, research articles, and more. We will see you again for another great interview with an expert guest. <music>